Soko Sakwo. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Michigan Soccer Central Podcast, your weekly dip into the world's game being played right here in the Great Lakes State of Michigan. How's it going? My name is Robert Kerr, your host as always here on the program. Your uh, center for all things soccer in Michigan, whether you're a coach, player, supporter, or all of the above, uh, this is where the Michigan soccer community meets. Uh, first show of 2023 over on the socials, we have a rundown of the five most popular episodes or most played episodes of the podcast of 2022. So go check that out and see if your favorite episode was on there. I think we're going to do a little bit of a more rundown of some of the staff's favorite picks. So some interesting conversations that uh, weren't necessarily the top five most listened to. Over on the socials, there's been a number of coaching announcements and some expansion sides announced in the Midwest Premier League. Um, there's also some news coming from Oakland County FC here in the next week. So look out for them. They might have an announcement or two themselves coming up. Um, Detroit City FC announced that uh, their stalwart goalkeeper, Nate Steinwasher, is coming back for an eighth season with an option for a ninth. I believe I read there was plenty of rumor and speculation if he would be coming back to the side. And he is. Uh, A number of departures have uh, taken place on the DCFC squad that was already a little bit thin. So I'm sure supporters are waiting with bated breath to see who else is coming in. And there's definitely been more outbounds and inbounding uh, players, and it was already a thin squad. We'll see what Trevor James and uh, DCFC have up their sleeve for their roster building for the 2023 season. And I think it's just fun <laughs> to say we're in the 2023 season because uh, new calendar year brings that that new season ever cl- uh, closer or seems like it's realistic. You're done with the dead end of the previous uh, season's calendar year, and we can really look forward to what's ahead in the busy uh, spring and summer months of soccer here in the Great Lakes State. So this week's feature interview is another uh, look over the shoulder at uh, probably the biggest event in our favorite sport, uh, the World Cup. And I've managed to get connected to a Metro Detroiter who, or a Michigander who spent three weeks and uh, went to 12 World Cup matches in Qatar. So a very unique perspective. He stayed with family over there. So very unique American perspective of uh, the tournament and just some great firsthand anecdotes and stories and some great memories shared there by uh, uh, my guest this week. So enjoy uh, a look at uh, a Michigander's trip to uh, World Cup. Qatar 2022 here on the Michigan Soccer Central Podcast. Welcome back here on Michigan Soccer Central Podcast. I've been very excited for this next segment. We've got a Muhammad Hassan Rahman with us, a Metro Detroiter who made a three-week adventure of going to our favorite game's biggest spectacle. Uh, Hassan, you spent a, a long time over in Qatar, took in a dozen matches. Thank you for coming on Michigan Soccer Central to uh, share your experiences with us. Thanks, Robert, for having me. Um, to be honest, this was a dream. Uh, I've been planning this event, you know, this trip for like the last three years. The moment I remember uh, 11 years ago, the moment it was announced it's going to be in Qatar, I had my cousins in Qatar at that time, and I was like, you know what? I will be there 2022. Mark my words. I will be in Qatar. I'll be watching the games. And guess what happened? 2022 comes in. I'm planning my stuff together. I'm getting everything ready. I told my cousins, yo, I'm going to be there. Just be ready, and we're going to be watching the games together and all that. I made it happen. I made that long living dream of mine that I wanted to see. Uh, first of all, I'm a huge fan of Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh, growing up, um, I play. I play this game. I played a lot. So growing up, seeing him play and seeing him motivate me, making me believe in hard work, passion, and dedication, it was something 
um, that I remember a child, you know, he looked up upon him and be like, okay, I want to be like him. Although, you know, not everyone can be him, but just that drive that get you know, gets you going was from that man. So I was like, you know what? I really need to see him play for his country, especially when it's his last World Cup. I have to be there. Other than him, Messi. No words needed for that legend right there. He is a living goat. And I will always say this, that I've seen him play right now. Just two words. Different gravy. He's not from this planet. <laughs> there is no way this man is from this planet. Because I see him toying with those players like they're nothing for him. And I mean, even the worst players, right? Like you can think of, okay, if you think of a player compared to like, let's say Costa Rican player, right? You cannot compare him to uh, a Messi or even Ronaldo or anyone in uh, a top tier team right now. But if you see them play, you'll see the difference that the World Cup actually have. Like those players are elite. They're all world-class. For Messi to actually be like, dribbling around those players like they're nothing is not normal this is not normal for him to actually carry a team score braces this is not normal this i mean i've witnessed something that i i think like will be a part of you know history and will be a part that we'll be telling our kids our future generations that this happened and we saw it happen live yeah i mean the tournament on the field especially with how it turned out with messi winning was just unreal uh, so how many uh times did you get to see ronaldo and how many times did you get to see messi how many which uh, games uh did you see so for ronaldo i saw all the games except for the morocco game because unfortunately i was i had to come back because of my work uh it was no more remote so i was like oh man i have to fly back but like you know what before that i watched all the uh, portugal games i saw the man play live for messi i uh, it was so so heavily booked for Argentina because a lot of Argentinians actually flew from Argentina to Qatar, uh, like through on, like after the group stages and stuff. So for round of 16, I somehow got the tickets for round of 16 and I saw uh, Argentina versus Australia and a beautiful game where Messi scored and I was there when he scored. It was a different atmosphere. Uh, it was in Lucille, you know, a theater dream, um, a place that I cannot explain by words because just being there, you would get goosebumps in just that stadium. It's a massive stadium, a capacity of around 88,000 people holding in that stadium. Imagine 88,000 people playing, uh, I mean, watching the game. And out of 88, probably 80,000 people are supporting uh, Argentina and those 8,000 are supporting Australia. So if Argentinians get the ball, it's already the stadium is moving. The pressure that was on the Australian team was just, you cannot fathom the pressure. It's just unreal. So that part, I think, just the fans. I mean, to be honest, if I have to give a rating for the best fans, Argentinian fans. They were out there. They knew the the anthems. They, they were there for the passion. I mean, you would not believe this, but this happened uh, in, in real life. And I asked an Argentinian fan, like, how did you get here, you know? For, for people to plan this, for me to plan this, it was a three-year planning for me to get this in my budget. Because to be honest, if it, it's a trip from overseas going from US or somewhere in like South America, right? It's a long trip to somewhere in the Middle East. Plus the stay was expensive, the tickets and everything. So I asked him and the guy literally told me, he's like, I sold my house to be here. Oh. And I, I was like, I don't know if I should respect the passion right now. Because like I don't care about anything right now. I sold my house, but because I wanted to see Messi play his last World Cup, and I wanted to see him lift the trophy. I mean, for him, worth it. He did it. He he actually saw him lift the trophy by selling a house. And it's not just him. It's a lot of people who sell their their houses, their savings, blow up everything they have just to be part of the beautiful game. Yeah, that's that's a level of passion that's just uh, totally unreal and. I can't imagine. So they definitely got rewarded. Uh, their passion was rewarded with the best possible outcome uh, that they could have had. I mean, they got to see the storybook ending of their heroic figure winning it. With that, I mean, <laughs> one thing, I mean, what do they do now that they move, now that they're home and they don't have a house? That, that's what I asked him. I'm like, what's you going to go back? How are you going to live? He's like, I'm going to live in an apartment. I'll pay the rent. I mean, I still have a job, but I don't want my house anymore. I mean, just for me to see was Messi play live and win the World Cup. And I mean, I left before I could see the man 
being happy and just in tears of joy. But I'm pretty sure he was happy and having the tears of joy because I saw a lot of Argentinians, even just in the U.S. Because I was I was here for the final uh, when the final were go going on, and I I live in uh, Ann Arbor right now, and I saw a lot of Argentinians just roaming around in Ann Arbor, showing the passion they have, uh, shouting their songs. And it was just a beautiful sight to see in general. So I couldn't even imagine how it would be in Qatar because that place was packed with Argentinian fans. When I say packed, I mean packed with Argentinian fans. So it was just like a, almost like a critical mass, like the, the energy almost had a, like a physical presence. Oh, yeah. Those Argentina yeah. games. For, for, for certain teams, you can see a physical presence was, um, I, I, if I talk about teams, it's going to be Brazil, it's going to be Argentina, it's going to be Mexico. Because a lot of people, uh, the most fans, I would say, were from Argentina and Mexico. Uh, reason being, a lot of Mexicans actually flew from Mexico or the U.S. to uh, go and support their country. Because they know that the next World Cup is going to be in their country. And for them, it's a big thing because they have... they've. They held the World Cup before too, so it's you know it's it's a big uh, incoming for for the Mexican culture, and for them uh, they the passion you can see it in their eyes, you can see it you know just in the people roaming around the cities. Um, the other than that, I would say if you want to see fans of people, yes, Portuguese. I mean, when Ronaldo walks in, when Ronaldo takes a touch on the ball, when Ronaldo steps on the field. Everyone, it doesn't matter what your nationality is. You could be Indian, you could be Pakistani, you could be Bangladeshi, you could be Portuguese, you could be Argentinian, you could be anyone in the world. You could be American, British. But when that man touches the ball, they all stood up for him and praised him. Similarly for Messi, because they know and they respect the two goats that have played in our era. It's like I've seen, I've, I've, I've met those people who were uh, wearing the jerseys of you know the coaches that were coaching right now. So they have been. Uh, part of the team or like supporting the team since the coaches were actually a player like Gareth Southgate uh, from England. These people have seen more than two World Cups in their life. And all of them said that this World Cup, hands down, was the best managed World Cup, was the best World Cup in terms of actual games. Because you, you saw shocks, like you saw Saudi Arabia beating Argentina. No one would have thought. That team used to lose 7-0 to any big team, and now they're beating Argentina. It's not just because of, you know, um, that the game has evolved so much. No, uh, it's also because the place they're playing in. They also play it in the Middle East now. So it's technically a home for Saudi Arabia. The fans for Saudi Arabia were, were insane. Like, there were a lot of fans traveling from Saudi Arabia to come to Qatar because it's literally a five-minute drive from the border of Saudi Arabia. So for them, it was absolutely nothing. It's like home ground for them. So they have to like, a, a European team wouldn't, wouldn't you know, think about all of this because most of the time they've played uh, a, the sport in a, in a place like South America or Europe uh, where, you know, the tradition is, oh, we have it. It's just the big eight teams uh, would always make it to the quarterfinals. You see now uh, we have uh, Morocco making it to the semifinals. No one would have thought an African team would make it so far. Uh, and even if, if even if we're going to say an African team, we had Cameroon back in the days. We had Senegal back in the days. We still have Senegal, but it's Morocco who made it. Um, beautiful talent, beautiful players. But the game has changed, yes, but it also it, it changes when you play in someone else's home. Similarly, when Brazil was playing in their home uh, and they lost 7-1 to Germany, it was a different it was a different atmosphere for them. And again, when they played right now in Qatar, it was almost like it was Brazil's home because just the thing that Brazil brings in, the idea of inventing the game or, you know, the, everyone knows when you talk about the game, Joga Bonita, the beautiful game you, you related to Brazil. And just for them to have that passion in everyone's eyes, I've seen a lot of Indians who were supporting Brazil. I've seen a lot of different nationalities in general supporting Brazil with all of their heart. They're like, this is my team. I call it my team. I call these players my player. They call Vinicius their player. They call Rodrigo their player. The reason being because they're so highly influenced uh, by Brazil. And I would say, yes, I mean, everyone is. We love that team. Mm -hmm. Everyone loves, you know, the Brazilian team. They were the fan favorite. But again, them getting that shock by Croatia was a, a thing that silenced Qatar for a day. I was. I saw tears in people's eyes. I saw fans crying all over. I saw everyone crying, because 
that day, uh, you know, um, our legend uh, Pele, RIP, um, you know, everyone knew that he is in hospital. Everyone wanted Brazil to do it uh, once more, uh, do it for the legend. Um, but when that shot came in, uh, everyone was just silent. And I, I never saw Qatar, like, fall that silent in that moment. Although Croatian fans were so, like, yes, they were yelling. They were so happy. They were roaming around. But you can not fathom how many supporters Brazil have and then Croatia has. Croatia would be a minority in terms of Brazil. So a lot of people were just sad to see their team get knocked out like that. Even though Neymar scored a textbook goal, literally the, one of the best goals of uh, the tournament. But again, it was it was not their day. It was it was just not their day. Speaking of uh, best goals, with the amount of games you saw, I mean, kudos to just having like a a footy marathon, like twelve games in like twenty days or so. Did you mm-hmm. do any two games in one day? Yeah, I I did two games in like three days because some of those games that I couldn't miss, uh, I was like, no, I'm I'm gonna go for both of the, these games and I'm gonna rest tomorrow because you know sometimes I have to like sacrifice on which games I can make it to, which games I cannot. So, uh, but that's one part which uh, you raise a point to. Um, this is a very uh, a part that a lot of us tend to forget that Qatar is such a small country that. All of these games or what's what's like all the stadiums were within a radius of almost 30 miles. So if you want to see the games, you want to see all four games, you can see all four games in group stages time in, in the same day. So a lot of people were so happy that they could see those four games in a day. Like people who, who came from Russia uh, and were in Russia last time, um, you know, they said, Oh no, we couldn't watch like two games in two weeks even because you had to take a flight to a different city. You had to book hotels. It was so hard to get tickets and all that. But in Qatar, they did it. I don't know how they managed it. But the management, I, I would say, uh, one of the best managements I've ever seen in my life because I live in an arbor. We have uh, Michigan games. Uh, if you know the Michigan Big House Stadium, it's one of the largest stadiums in the world. It hosts uh, around 100,000 uh, you know people every single game day but when they walk out it's always uh you know a mess and walking out of course they walk out there's always a mess and roaming around it's not it's not that easy to walk out uh, out of a stadium with 110,000 people you know in it but so did Qatar Qatar had these games going on four times in a day they, but they still managed it somehow they had metros running they had taxis running they had uber running everything was just so well managed that you would not um, you know, be in a hassle of going, oh, I need to, you know, leave three hours early to get to the stadium. No, you don't need to leave three hours early to get to the stadium. You will always be able to make it to the stadium, even if you leave, like, exactly by the time that you wanted to leave. Because it's just, the main, the, this flow was just well-streamed. Interesting. So, like, a lot of the people were all coming from the same places, going to the same destinations, and there was uh, adequate uh, things for it. And one of the things I heard just from broadcast and major media was, was there a lot of the same people going from games to games? Like, did you see some of the same people at one game and see them at the next one? So, yeah. So that, that's um, a lot of the, there, there were people that were coming from the same game to another game. It's usually because these people are tourists and um, these people are leaving within like three days. Um, I had a lot. I made a lot of friends there. I made I met a lot of people, especially from the U.S. too, because I watched a lot of the U.S. games. Um, so the U.S. people, uh, Amer- Americans, when they came, they wanted to watch every game that they could have because they were only there for like four days or three days. So they had to like watch the first game in the morning and then go for the second game in the evening and all of that, uh, you know, manage it all together. So yes, you would see a lot of people um, from the same, you know, area. But again, some stadiums are hold, host, holding only 45,000 uh, people. The other stadium are 65 for Albait and then Lucille is 90,000 almost. So it's... It's gonna have more people. I I couldn't find empty seats in almost every game. It was packed. So did you stay at like a like I guess what were your accommodations? Did you stay in one place the whole time? Was it a hotel? Like what what was the arrangements there? Because it's it's such a foreign uh, the other side of the world. So I'm curious. Yeah. So uh, for me, uh, I stayed with my cousins. They they live in Qatar. So for me, the stay was all like it was very well hosted. Uh, kudos to my cousin. Um, uh, but I think uh, if 
I have I had friends who who came from the U.S. Also, University of Michigan. They went to the World Cup too. They sit in the fan village. It was it was seventy five dollars per night. Uh, that was probably the cheapest ac- accommodation that you could get for the World Cup. Um, they were for all the fans. For example, for if you're supporting uh, the U.S. team, you'll live with uh, a bunch of like U.S. supporters, which is which is a thing that you will you'll make more friends. You know, supporting the same team, you'll you'll find a USMNT uh, people. And all that. Similarly for Portugal, similarly for Argentina, Brazil, Croatia, Japan, Costa Rica, all of them. Um, but uh, if you want to find hotels, they were super expensive. Again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just blame um, uh, a country or uh, anyone because they're hosting literally the biggest, well, the biggest sporting event in the history uh, for such a small country. You only have a certain amount of hotels to live in, so you know it's supply and demand. What a lot of people did was uh, they would rather stay in Dubai. Um, and uh, use a shuttle that flies every morning and goes back every night, um, so you can come watch the game and fly back uh, the same, the same night and stay in Dubai, which is much cheaper than staying in Qatar at that time. Did you see any like protests or any sort of stuff like that while you were over there? Yeah. So um, I I I had the only thing I saw was the fight between Swiss and Serbia. Other than that, I saw a lot of fuss on the media that, oh, this is happening in Qatar or this is happening at Qatar. Me being there, uh, talking to the people who were there. Uh, I only saw positive vibes from the people. That's just my personal experience. Um, yes, every 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 country might have their ups and downs, but overall, I met people from, I think, every single nationality in this world, and none of them had complaints about the World Cup. They had com- some of them had complaints about the alcohol um, uh, that hey we're not being able to find the alcohol, but yeah I mean it's a country that has different laws um, you know you have to respect the laws of the country you can find the alcohol when you go outside uh, or or even in in the stadium itself a lot of people don't know this even in the stadium itself there were hospitality tickets so the hospitality tickets are the one that you can find uh, that you can get alcohol with so in those places you were able to drink alcohol. But again, those are those are some minor things coming from a fo- like the fan of the game. Like I'm a football fan, I could care less about alcohol at that point. I really just wanted to see my uh, you know my players play. Uh, just in general, those players being there, um, it was a different thing for me. Like I saw the final, all the final players all together. I saw France, I saw Argentina play together. Uh, I mean, not together, play uh, you know the games. So. For me, just seeing a player in real life, it's it was. This is the first game at. I mean, of course, at this magnitude I've ever attended. But for me, I've never seen any of these players, even in their club games or ever, ever before. So this was my first time seeing, you know, you know, great players or even legends play. I would say, all of my life I've played this game, but I cannot compare it to this level ever. I've never seen players like this. For example, Mbappe. I mean, scoring hat trick in the final, yes. I mean, I've played with this man in FIFA every single time. Run down the wing because you know you can abuse pace with Mbappe. That's literally true. That's what they do in France. This man is a hack. He would run. He would just run past anyone like he's a Ferrari or something. He would go foom, and he can finish from any angle. I, I have I have videos of him scoring on camera because he was that close to me. I. Mbappe was super like when I watched France versus Denmark, they were so close to me. I was like, you can shout the. I remember a person shouting Coman's name when he was warming up, and Coman literally waved at him. So it's oh. <laughs> it's a it's a, it's a different it's a different experience. For me, uh, my favorite memory would be uh, when I I planned this to go and watch you know the trainings of these uh, players because they train a day before and you know before the games and just light warm up. So what I did for Portugal was I took an Uber to their training spot. I, you know, researched my thing and found out where they were training because this is still a public information. Um, so I went there and uh, there were a lot, a lot of cops and everything. They're like, no, you can't go in. They didn't let my Uber stop there. I was like, you know what, Uber, just just put like, I'll just get out here and I'll walk towards them. So I was walking towards them. The, the cops stopped me. They're like, no, uh, this is only for media. You can't come in. So no one is allowed here. I'm like, okay. So I go outside and I just stayed outside. I knew the bus would come and I would wait for the bus to come out and I'll just try my luck and say hi to, you know, the players. 
when the bus comes in, uh, the bus comes out and starts like driving towards me, I take out my camera, start waving at Ronaldo, start waving at every single player, Bruno Fernandes, you know, it was uh, Gonzalo Ramos, everyone. So I'm just waving my hand. All of them are just, you know, smiling at uh, me. And when I saw Ronaldo, I saw I started shouting because Ronaldo, Ronaldo, and all. I could I I still have it on my video when Ronaldo did this just to me because it was literally just me and one more guy over there. So it was it was a personal moment for me when Ronaldo just gave me a th- thumbs up. I was like, now my my day or my whole trip is complete. Now if even if I do whatever I want, it's just done. I don't want anything else from you know the World Cup anymore. That's awesome story. That's a a cool personal experience. Um, what was the best? Or most exciting or memorable on the field uh, moment you saw, goal, just skill, or just a moment in general. I think the moment in general. Um, it's a very underrated game, um, the Switzerland versus Serbia game. Uh, these two countries are, um, you know, a rival in the game. Uh, they always go at each other. Um, I walked in the field and uh, I walked in the stadium and there were fights going on with like just Serbians and uh, Swiss people in general, like the verbal fights and stuff. This is the game that they actually, okay, this is a very fun fact. This is the only game that they actually had to announce mid game. This is 70th minute in the game. There's an announcement made in the stadium that uh, please be respectful for the other uh, nationalities. Please don't use, uh, you know, a false language and stuff like that. And I was so shocked. I'm like, why is this happening? Because this game was super heated. You can see it from the players. They're fighting. I saw fights happening. But when that Shakiri goal came in, you could see that small, because uh, there are a lot of Serbians that compared to Swiss, you can see those small Swiss fans just cheering. And Shakiri goes to all those Serbian fans and just celebrating in front of them. That's one of the moments I cannot forget watching live because Shakiri is a player that goes very underrated. He played for Liverpool, was always a great player. But when it comes to Switzerland, he always shows up. He has always scored and carried that team. And he did that this year too. Um, again, they, they couldn't do it against Portugal when they lost 6-1. Um, I, I was there at that game when Gonzalo Ramos um, had a hat-trick in a quarterfinal. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, round of 16. So for that game, also, that's one of the memories because... I saw history being made. The first Portuguese to actually score a, a round of 16 hat trick, which was crazy. But again, all of these memories just, uh, you know, are are going to be part of, uh, of my entire life now and something I'll always live by that I witnessed what people would call a write down in history live. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like some amazing moments. And I do recall... The uh, Swiss played Serbia four years ago, and I remember Shakiri scored in that game as well. And he threw up the, like the Kosovo Iron Eagle. Did was it something? Did it all that bubble yeah. up from there? Yeah. Did, so he. Uh, so the root that the idea. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just gonna say he did that again. So he didn't. He didn't. He didn't do the flag again. What he uh, because everyone knew. Uh, everyone told him there was a political issue that you know, we can't do the flag again because uh, that's kind of going towards the Albanians and uh, you know. I don't want that political issues again. But he just goes in front of Serbians and he like he imposes that facial structure that he wants to do that flag and just the idea of like him still being uh, you know to his roots and showing those Serbians that yo uh, what I did four years ago I'm here to do it again. Just that piled up and was so you know like the you can see the anger in the Serbians you can see them being angry again. Mitrovic from uh, Serbia is one of the you know, really good players have seen him. But when he scored and when he uh, when he started uh, celebrating in front of the Swiss fans, you can see the Swiss having those anger uh, against him. So it was just, for me, I was a very neutral fan there. I was not supporting, but I was supporting the game. But witnessing this game, it was, it was really, really a different game. Also, it was a very knockout kind of game. If, if even they'd Swiss, even if Swiss tied, they would have gone out. Both of those teams would have gone out. So Swiss really needed that win uh, uh, to get through. They did get the win, and um, eventually they went through. But unlucky in the round of 16, they played Portugal with a very attacking uh, format of Portugal. So going back to uh, you went to all the Portugal games, and you said that the Portugal fans were very intense, and whenever he touched the ball, there was a reaction. 
So what was the 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 feeling in the crowd when he wasn't getting the playing time? So um when the games used to start, um, you know, when he would warm up, they would all shout his name and he would show us just by the shots. If you a lot of the times you can see on Instagram and his um, you know, warming up shots are like, you know, on Instagram. I I saw it live. He was shooting bangers. He was literally shooting bangers in like uh, in front of me warming up. And when he would not play, everyone would just look at the bench. I remember, you know, the, that picture that uh, the team is literally on the flag and everyone is reciting the national anthem. But every single cameraman is towards Ronaldo. I was in that stadium. I saw that happen. And I had goosebumps. I'm like, that's the influence. That's how big that person is that everyone is looking at him that why is he not playing that's and i remember uh, a lot like right now uh, one of the best uh, insta audios or something is that uh, you know a lot of people shouting ronaldo ronaldo it's when everyone in the stadium started saying his name we wanted him to play and that's when the coach actually put him on cuz literally <laughs> everyone in the stadium was just saying ronaldo nothing else other than ronaldo and when he comes on, everyone stood up, uh, you know, gave that graceful celebration to him that, yes, the legend has touched the ball now. So it was it was it was a different feeling, you know, he, you know, him not playing him, uh, uh, a different format of uh, coaching was going on. I mean, I understand they won 6-1 um, against Swiss without Ronaldo in sh- uh, starting. But when you're playing Morocco and you know that Morocco has been playing that counterattacking game and they're gonna dip, they're gonna do they're literally gonna park the bus if you if they score a goal, you have not played Ronaldo, you have not played literally the most senior player on the team who has played the most knockout games ever in life. Secondly, you're also not playing Jao Cancelo. Now I didn't understand. Okay, you can make an excuse that okay you didn't play Ronaldo because you had a six one uh, you know uh, win without Ronaldo. But again, you made that 6-1 win because you played all out attacking. You literally played Gonzalo Ramos, who has not played a single knockout game of Benfica. So you played that man. But you're now playing Jao Cancelo. That's one of the best defenders the world has ever seen right now. And you're subbing him out for, for I, I don't know. But that game, I was just upset in general. Although Morocco made history, uh, I was happy for them. You know, Hakim, uh, Ashraf Hakimi, uh, Hakim Ziyech, they... They have proven themselves outside and they've shown the world who they are. Especially Ziyech, he used to get benched for Chelsea. Him just carrying that team, you know, being a big figure in the team right now, showed uh, the world that, no, he's not done. He's not He's not rusted. He's still there. He just needs to, you know, play have more playtime even in Chelsea. So you went to a lot of games and it sounded like you had a lot of different points. Like you definitely seemed like a supporter through and through. You wanted to see lots of different aspects. So who did you actually, I think I might know the answer, but who, what team were you actually supporting when you were there? So again, I was supporting USA first of all, you know, we have to support the lads, but uh, other than USA, I was supporting Portugal. Uh, I, I'm a massive Portuguese fan. I love the team. Um, it's mostly because of Ronaldo. That's why I support Portugal. But I was supporting U.S. and Portugal, and I saw all their games as long as they were in the, you know, in the, in the tournament. And I was, I was actually impressed by how U.S. initially played. Uh, we played pretty well. Uh, Pulisic actually putting his life on on the line against Iran to actually beat uh, Iran. Uh, just him doing all all of it for you know being that Captain America that he is. Uh, it was really impressive uh, seeing it live. It was really good. Uh, I was shocked by how many supporters we had. One of the things I would I would say we did the best was um, uh, when Americans, you know, our support, uh, the fans that we had, maybe we might have 5,000 fans in general in an 85,000 stadium, right? But those fans would be diehard fans will be shouting throughout the game. They'll be saying those chants, USA, USA, throughout the game. They'll not get tired. So that's something I am, I'm really impressed. Uh, I see a lot of support from the USMNT group. And... Uh, just in general, the U.S. fans coming together, meeting, having you know um, hangouts together was really was really a, a good thing to see from a, a country that um, you know is now finally part of the World Cup and you know is is showing themselves that you know we it, we can dominate this game too. We literally had a draw against England. England technically saying, well, you know, it's coming home for the last I don't know how many years. We 
we did we did play pretty well to a team that has been saying it's coming home and it, it never does yeah around here uh there was a bazillion watch parties for that usa england what was the atmosphere at that one that was one you went to right yeah so the us england uh was i would say uh it was fairly evenly distributed with, between the fans i saw a lot of us supporters that game too uh but again the english supporters were 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 really um some of them were really getting mad that how are how are they now playing that you know they're a world class team and technically they think of you know the USMNT as a as a team that's upcoming that's not already there they think of them as an upcoming team and they're like how are we drawing to this team how are we not you know able to finish against it, these teams but again the US team literally proved themselves so pull it Weston McKinney uh giving it all of like what he had uh Sergio Dest was giving every single inch of his body that game he put his body on the line defending and running making those runs on the wing i believe us showed uh the world that um you know we are still we still got this and when it's coming to us you know the next world cup 2026 what's going to happen in our own hometown we'll have the support we'll have everything we can show the world uh i'm pretty sure i would not be surprised to see us in uh quarter finals or through from now onwards they played they played a pretty well game although we had a very unfortunate round of 16 but we can make it through i mean that seemed like pretty much their ceiling like they did well to get out of the group and they came across like a real deal team and they weren't up to it probably because of depth that they got a little tired from what i saw so that mm-hmm. like that shows just like you know they could hang at some level but there was a bridge too far yeah i mean uh again when a lot of these teams some when you play a, a game at this magnitude you're playing world cup you're playing especially knockouts of the world cup you cannot fathom uh, uh you know how how the other team would play you cannot uh judge a team by its players you cannot judge a team by their previous games every single game is a new new game new day uh you don't know the passion in their eyes yeah that's that's one of the reasons why you see shocks so many times in the world cup like from from like back in 1930s to to now it's every single world cup would have a, a small shock to everyone for example cameroon beating uh brazil is because even though you think of the other team like oh brazil when brazil played cameroon they didn't play uh, all of their players they're thinking that oh you know cameroon is an easy team and we already won so we don't really need to play the best players that we have any team can prove you wrong there and so did uh us us actually played like underdogs in the group stages and we did prove uh the giants wrong um but again uh sometimes we need to work more on our um you know on our team i think us us in the next 4 years i see there's a good potential we have the talent um a lot of our players are actually playing in europe now so that's one of the thing that shows us that yes our players are good enough for for the rest of the world because our players be playing in uh Barcelona in Dortmund in uh in Chelsea so and even in Italy Juventus so we we do have players that can that have the potential to go further and we just need to work more on it and you know the more we play the more now go stages we get it's going to be a good experience for uh, us and i think um you know our games with Mexico uh would would flourish that and you know make it more uh, better for us now that after your your uh cross uh continent or globe trotting uh soccer adventures come to a close and you've obviously brought back with you uh countless uh lifelong memories uh are you tired of football for a little bit or uh w- what's filling your uh soccer appetite now that you're home um I don't think I can I can ever get filled with uh you know the game. Um I landed I was when I remember when I landed back to the US I was sad. I was like damn I need to I need something to get the sadness out of me. And uh, next day I went to play. I just went to play on my own. I'm like yeah I need to I need to touch the ball and to have something to roam around with right now because I'm coming from a nation that the game was going on everywhere. I mean although a lot of people were supporting in the US but you cannot compare it to a country that actually was hosting the World Cup because everyone around was just talking about the game playing the game was you know everything was involved within the game so right now i'm just watching the premier league um 
Today were beautiful games. United uh, won their game. But a beautiful play by Casemiro, Rashford, and everyone. So I think um, I'm just making sure I follow the Premier League uh, right now. Uh, my 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 legend, my goat, has joined uh, the Saudi League today. So I was I was seeing that presentation to uh, Al Nasser. Um, let's see what what uh, what's in the book for him because uh, although after the World Cup we see so many moves, uh, this is a move that is very interesting. Um, playing in the Saudi League, it's a uh, it's a very uh, you cannot of course you cannot compare it to anywhere close to the top five leagues in the world. But let's see what Ronaldo actually does in it. Um, you know he has conquered. I would not debate on him. Going to the league, or that's his choice. But he has conquered. He has conquered England. He has conquered Italy. He has, he conquered Spain. So let's see what he does in Asia. And you know, um, at thirty-seven years old, let's see if he still has it for a league. Well, um, Hamid Hassan Rahman, thank you so much uh, for bringing uh, your uh, supporter perspective, uh, local football fan, Spain in the world to see uh, the World Cup. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us. Hey guys, this is Zoo from Michigan Soccer Central, one of your co-hosts covering all soccer in Michigan from amateur to professional, men's to women's. Uh, I'd just like to take a little bit of time to talk about Anchor, which is the service that we're using to produce our podcast. Uh, it's a free service that you can find online or in the App Store. Uh, there are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your f- your phone or your computer. Uh, Anchor distributes the podcast, so something really cool there. It'll go to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other, other services, so you don't have to worry about distributing it yourself. And you can make money from these podcasts, so there's no minimum listenership, and you can activate those sponsorships on there. Uh, all in one place, it's everything you need. So all you need to do is download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thanks. Thank you to Hassan for joining the program once more. Great to catch his stories of World Cup Qatar 2022. Interesting to get some uh, first-hand details and some stories about uh, the biggest uh, sporting event uh, <laughs> of the year and uh, one of the uh, most unique ones in, uh, in, in recent sport history. Thank you to all the guests that have come on to the Michigan Soccer Central podcast your perspectives and your insights and stories and being part of the Michigan uh, soccer landscape. Uh, you know, that's what makes this show and that's what this show is all about. Um, and check out the Michigan Soccer Central socials for a countdown of uh, the top five played episodes of this show in 2022, as well as some uh, some picks from the MSC crew. And thank you to Jenny Hajnaki for editing this program as always. And thank you to the Michigan Soccer Central core team for helping this show. Because with you guys or without you guys, this show does not go. So uh, great game ahead. I'm definitely going to catch one this weekend. Indoor soccer action, cross-state match, Rapid City FC from Grand Rapids is coming east to play Waza in some major league indoor soccer action at the Detroit City FC Fieldhouse. And so that'll be running side by side with the other uh, big football game that's going on on Sunday night. So until next time, everybody, please enjoy your soccer.